They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. The unburied dead are coming back to life and seeking human victims. Welcome to a podcast from Renate. This week we'll be discussing The Exorcist. And we have two guests with us, uh, writer and director of Demon Resurrection, William Hopkins. William, how's it going? Good. How you doing, Kerry? I'm doing awesome. And a writer and director of Butterfly Kisses, who has been on the show before, both of them have, uh, Eric Myers. How's it going, Eric? Doing well. Thanks for having me back. Oh, anytime, anytime. Billy, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. You look During pretty my day off. There. Yeah, you look pretty relaxed. Yes, I am. <laughs> and Aaron, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm looking at my screen here. It looks like the Brady Bunch beginning. Yeah. <laughs> As it should. Yes. Right, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, so, um, how's everybody? How about, how's everybody getting along during the uh, the pandemic? Well, it's unusual times. We weren't expecting the end of the world. Uh, right. Back in January, I think uh, the biggest inconvenience that I thought we'd be facing was the fact that they weren't going to allow us to use plastic bags in the stores anymore. And uh, shortly after that, we weren't even allowed to go out of our homes. So. Uh, it's a, it certainly has been a shock, uh, shock to the system. But it might be appropriate to be talking about The Exorcist uh, because that came out at a time, the book and the movie came out at a time when society was uh, go going through some big changes as well. Riots, assassinations, all the kids were on drugs. Uh, they were all having sex, apparently. I mean, it was a perfect time for The Exorcist. And I guess uh, for for some folks, they might, I still find some value in the film now, in the message of the film. I'd say it's kind of similar, but it's also very different in the sense that, yes, you did have the generation gap. Yes, you were um, post-Nixon. You were dealing with Watergate. You were dealing with, you know, the, 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 the youth rebellion in Vietnam and all that stuff. But the difference there is that drugs were easily accessible. Sex was something you were able to have without a mask. Um... Yeah, it was a more fun end of the world. That's true, yeah. More fun. More fun, you meant to say, or more fun? <laughs> uh, more, more, uh, more, more accessible. Yes, yeah. Well, Blatty and Friedkin both denied that the film and the book had any social relevance at all. They denied that there was any message to it. But it's kind of hard to believe when you read the book, and, which I actually just did uh, this past week, just to refresh my memory, it's pretty hard to believe that he didn't see what was going on around him and he, that he wasn't trying to address it in some way. Well, I, I mean, I'll... you you start the whole book and movie off with Ellen Burstyn's character, Chris McNeil, who is involved with a campus crisis. Um, and you then segue into the generation gap. You have her daughter um, who is becoming this, essentially a juvenile delinquent um, hypersexualized using foul language and really representing what adults were seeing in their draft dodging long hair, you know, stoner kids at the time. It's, it's, it's very, very transparent. And maybe Blatty didn't intend that. And I, I knew William Peter Blatty and he was, you know, he was not approaching this story in any way as somebody who was trying to make a fun horror movie. And he really wasn't interested in going for allegory. This, this was straight up uh, evangelism. He wanted to scare people back into church. Let me go back to the um, them saying that they didn't intentionally have anything. I, I think a lot of directors do that. I think, uh, George Romero was famous for everybody here for him saying that his dead movies didn't have any social commentary. But if you watch those movies, they, they match up pretty well with the time that they were in. Do yeah. you think it, do you think that directors and we got two directors here, is it, just, is it just a, they didn't want to be, you know, they just wanted I, to say they had the idea. I think in the case of Friedkin, uh, he was embarrassed, I think, uh, because he was, 
a Hollywood film director. He was one of the new Hollywood uh, directors, right? He came in with that wave of people like Peter Bogdanovich and Martin Scorsese. So he didn't want to seem to be uh, an evangelist for the Catholic Church. Uh, and I think that's probably why he sort of waved his hand at all those folks that were trying to um, uh, figure out what the movie meant. It seems pretty obvious that, and as a matter of fact, Mark Commode, the British film critic, he's a big champion of The Exorcist as a film. He thinks it's the greatest film of all time. And he wrote a book uh, about the film, and he says in it that Vladdy was actually telling his Catholic priest friends that they should help him with this because it would be so great for Catholicism to have this uh, story told. So he really was an evangelist. And to be honest, I think the reason why the film is so good is because you have a fellow who really believes the story. Right? He's re he really believes in demonic possession. He really believes in the power of uh, the power of Christ compels you. All that stuff. He's down completely for that. And then you have another guy, a freaking, who's a sort of a cinematic savant. He doesn't have any strong feelings about anything, but he knows how to make a really powerful and effective movie. So that when those two guys got together, that was all. You, that was all you needed. It's. I just watched the film last night, and you know I'm still in awe of how well, especially the first half of the film, which is usually not the part of the film that people are impressed by. But when you watch those scenes with the mother and the daughter talking quietly with each other, or the scene, the whole sequence where uh, Karis visits his mother, that is almost like documentary style. It's not surprising because William Friedkin was a documentary filmmaker before he went into feature films. And that, of course, is what's so unfortunate about Friedkin then backpedaling on his own atheism yes. um, to recut the film and create what was originally called the version you've never seen, which is essentially um, Star Wars in anything but name with this terrible, intrusive sound of, um, soundtrack now mm -hmm. where this, this film originally used very, very sparse um, music and now there are all of these cues that have been jammed in there there is cgi all over the place and he has taken so many of the scenes that blatty felt were so important in the novel and in the original shooting script that just underlined and overemphasized um these these very um catholic themes they've now been reinserted and it's completely changed the flavor of the film no, I agree with you on that. I, uh, I think that the, uh, I can understand why they felt they needed to add stuff. Because after all, this was a big release. When it was re-released, it was released like a new release. And it made a tremendous amount of money. I think it made $40 million in re-release. Uh, so they come to Friedkin and they say, look, we can't do this unless you're willing to put something back in. And they stick in the spider walk sequence, which was unnecessary. Uh, and all the scenes that you're talking about, and I have to admit the most puzzling thing, I can understand why he put the dialogue back in because William Peter Blatty had been bothering him for 30 years to do it. But why put that new music in? It destroys those scenes. Those scenes play perfectly, uh, like uh, Lieutenant Kinderman talking to, to Karis. That doesn't need any stings or cues to try to hype up the emotion. And when you put the music in, it, it saps the strength of the dialogue. You stop paying attention to the dialogue and you start paying attention to the music, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Right, yeah. just the Lee J. Cobb's performance as he's describing the Burke Dennings character with his head twisted around backwards was so strong because, it, as you said, it had a very documentary aesthetic to it. And so you felt like you were eavesdropping on a real conversation. Now it plays like a scene in a film, in a horror film. Now, do you think with with what you are saying, you know, the changes with the music and everything, you think those were, you know, people like, hey, man, we got to do something different. We can't just have it like this. This is what other movies are doing. So we're going to do it too. You know what I mean? You know, the suits right. get involved in things or the money gets involved with things. You think that's probably why they did it that way? Uh, honestly, my, my impression would be The Exorcist is one of those films that's a victim of its own reputation. And it is so frequently lauded as being the most terrifying film of all time. 
in much the same way that its sequel, The Heretic, is often called, you know, the worst sequel of all time. <laughs> and, uh, and while I agree with it being perhaps the worst sequel to a fantastic film ever made, anybody that thinks that's the worst sequel has not watched many movies. Um, yeah. But regardless, <laughs> the, the fact is that this movie has such a profound reputation that when it was re-released in 2000, there were so many kids or teenagers or even adults, particularly in, in Great Britain where the film had been banned, and as a video nasty, who were getting the opportunity to see it for the first time. And it was in so many ways an old fashioned film that it was boring, it was laughable, at least by contemporary standards. So I really feel like a lot of those things that were jammed in there, a lot of the CGI and the music was to try to modernize the film which simply works against what makes it a period piece. I, I think it's a very timeless film, but it is representative of what, you know, New Hollywood was doing in the 1970s. Now, Billy, you're the youngest person on here. What did you think of The Exorcist? And when, um, and when did you first see it? Um, I probably saw it when I was probably like 13 years old. And like movies never really scared me. Like only a few scared me, like Hellraiser. But The Exorcist was one of the other movies that creeped me out. Like, it, uh, just, it's, wait, I mean, what, what can you say about a movie that's already been talked about forever? It's, it's the greatest, one of the greatest horror movies ever made. The fact that you say it creeped you out, you're making a distinction between that sort of effect and it being scary? Because I think that's, yes. that's, an, yeah, that's an interesting thing. A lot of people go to these movies expecting jump scares, uh, yes. gore effects, things like that. And if it, you don't have heads rolling and entrails being splayed around in the first five minutes, they say, what is this? You know, this is boring. Uh, but there are films that aren't scary in that sense that are still unsettling and that you carry them with you and you feel a level of uh, a weirdness and suspense and tension while you're watching them, even when there's nothing particularly horrifying going on on the screen. I feel dread, like dread's coming. Dread is a good word for it, yes. Absolutely. The movie has a creeping feeling of inevitability, and you just feel like you, you are in a moving vehicle that is driving toward the wall, and you can't get out. You have right. to see it through the entire way. And that might be one reason. There are many reasons why none of the sequels are really very good, but one reason why is because they all think they have to front load the film with shocks. Right from the second film, you have the scene with Richard Burton witnessing the immolation of uh, the villager or whoever that was supposed to be, the possessed person. Um, basically what they're doing is they're denying themselves the, ab the ability to grow. Right? You can't go anywhere when you have a, in um, uh, the uh, Sh Schrader film, uh, Dominion, he starts the film with a little girl getting shot in the head and then a whole town of people being mowed down by the Nazis. Where can you go after that? Right? Well, that's the thing. And I, I don't want to veer too wildly off course, but I mentioned that I thought that this is, and I think it's a pretty indisputable fact that this film is a victim of its own success and reputation, but that translates to the entire franchise. You have this film, which was lightning in a bottle for so many different reasons. And when you come to The Heretic, um, this was a film that was self-consciously trying to be the opposite of The Exorcist in so many ways that it had to be recut in the theaters during its opening week of release. That had never happened before. And so then the third film is shot, at which point you have the artist who decides, well, this is the story I'm going to tell. And then the studio going, no, no, we have to make The Exorcist again, because look what happened with the second one. And then you end up with reshoots and multiple versions of the film. And then you end up with two prequels where one of them is put on a shelf because again, let's self-consciously make a different style film. And the studio says, no, it has to be more like the first one to the point where we then get a carbon copy of the same prequel directed by you know Paul Schrader's equal and opposite Rennie Harlan and that is such a disaster that you've got to pull the first film back down off the shelf <laughs> it's everyone trying to remake what was so effective Boxing Day 1973 and realizing you can't ever do that again 
but mm -hmm. you know, the uh, to a certain, I mean, I think that the sequels probably are an example of the worst management of a property uh, that we've ever seen in, in commercial film. Uh, every one of the sequels was a disaster in one way or another, either because the studio interfered or because the person who they hired to do the job didn't want to do what they wanted, which is kind of a, a strange thing. We tend, if we're, as, as filmmakers, we tend to champion our fellow filmmakers. So we tend to, to immediately go to the defense of somebody like um, Paul Schrader, who's a very talented guy, very intelligent guy. I have great admiration for him. But surely he knew, he'd been in the business for years. Surely he knew what they really wanted, whatever they were saying. And he said, well, I took this script that they gave me and I did the best I could with it, essentially. And I think he did, and he didn't do a bad film. There's nothing embarrassing about the film at all. But surely he must have realized that they were gonna have objections to a film that didn't really in any way represent uh, a commercial product. Even he said, I think he might've even said it in your interview with him, that he knew that this was never gonna be something that would be a blockbuster. But that's what they were hiring him for, right? Nobody hires you to do a sequel to, a, to The Exorcist, for Christ's sake, which was, at least for a time, one of the, the, the top-rated films in, in history. And he thought that they were just asking him to come in and do some little story about uh, British soldiers dealing with the tribes in Kenya. I mean, you know. And then he <laughs> sutures on, which is what seems to have happened uh, uh, several times, right? I mean, the third one the studio says you have to have an exorcism and he has to really throw uh, hello sorry <laughs> paul, schrader, paul schrader calling to tell me <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i mean he, he had to pretty much destroy his film to add in an, an exorcism that they would find acceptable and he should have seen that coming too i mean he's another guy had been in the business he was in the business before the exorcist right he was writing shirley mclean movies he knows how these guys think. And he also had the experience of The Exorcist too, right? He knew that, that what a shit show that was. So you we might, we just recently covered The Exorcist 3 and that was, that, yes. that was our complaint was the, the shoe, you know, this, the shoehorn ending of, you know, well, it's, it's yes. put the, because when he originally was going to make it, he did, he wanted to be nothing to do with The Exorcist. It was going to be, a, you know, the standalone. Yeah. Well, he wanted to use those characters and take Yeah, and you've got, yeah, you of course, you got to get the name, you know, you got to get the name on there, I guess, for, to get people in, in, in the seats. But uh, that was, that was our only problem with that movie was the, the shoehorned yep. ending. Well, the issue with that really comes down to a problem of concept. And, um, you know, without trying to, without spoiling too much, I'm working on a, on a big series of articles for Any Cool News, sort of detailing the history of The Exorcist Three. And Blatty, he opened up his vault to me and he shared a lot of, uh, you know, earlier drafts of the script, shooting materials. And it, it was always an issue of concept. And that problem was that he never nailed a satisfactory ending. Um, whether it was his original pitch, whether it was then the novel Legion that he wrote, um, the original um, script that Morgan Creek originally signed off on, the shooting script, the revised ending script. Um, he never got an ending that worked. And it was always a great concept. It was always a great story but it never had a third act that successfully managed to tie up all of the narrative threads that have been running up to that point. And specifically for um, Morgan Creek, it never included an exorcism until he was forced to jam one in there. And so, you know, it, it, that, that was always a great story in search of an ending. And, All right. And the ending that he actually ended up with in the book, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't read it, just as Lieutenant Kinderman shooting uh, the Gemini killer. No, that was actually the original ending that he shot, which was incredibly anticlimactic. Um, yeah, and be, the, yeah. the book just had the Gemini killer spontaneously dying. Oh. Uh, it was, it, again, there was never, satisfying. it never built to anything, right. so. Well, the changes that they insisted on beyond just having an exorcism also included bringing in another exorcist, which is loopy in the movie. It doesn't make any sense that this stranger would be able to be walking into a, 
maximum security mental hospital. He just sort of coasts in there like he's uh, uh, possessing divine power. And and, uh, the business with working Jason Miller in, that sort of confuses matters too, because is it the Gemini killer or is it Father Karras? So, you know, who the fuck is this? Well, I do have to argue with, with both of those points strictly because a lot of people never seem to understand how it is that um, Nicole Williamson's father mourning happens to show up when he does. There is a very quick blink and you miss it moment where George C. Scott as Kinderman is on the phone calling father mourning. He's asking to speak to the hospital chaplain because he has been informed earlier in the film that this chaplain has performed exorcisms before. So that that is set up. It's just, it's so fast that it barely registers. And um, the, the, the other side is that I think that as many people who complained about the alternating visage of the Gemini killer, is it Jason Miller, is it Brad Dourif, I saw that film in the theater on opening day when I was 14 and it blew my fucking mind the way that you went from Jason Miller to Brad Dourif and George C. Scott saying, well, you know, I'm seeing a man who looks like Jason Miller in front of me. And and Brad Dourif says, if you looked with the eyes of faith, you would see me. And I just, I got it. And I went, this is brilliant. This is a way for us to see what we never saw in the original Exorcist. We always saw the external manifestation of evil as, you know, the the skin suit that Pazuzu or whatever, you know, demonic entity you want to call it was wearing as Reagan McNeil. Now we are getting to see underneath. And I thought that that was brilliant and did not understand all the teenage girls in the theater that day that I heard whispering to their boyfriends, who is that? Right. Never, I, I didn't get it. I was like, come on, guys, I'm 14. I understand this. One of, the, one, one of the problems, though, is that in retrospect, we know that it was a decision that was forced on him, right? Sure. He didn't, he didn't want to do that. And actually, Brad Dourif, uh, if, if Lieutenant Kinderman looked at him and said, that man is Father Karras, then we would accept that because he is not the same actor that played uh, Kinderman in The Exorcist. And the guy who's Ed Flanders is not the same guy that played uh, uh, Father Dyer. So the fact that all of those guys are different, and of course we have the big question, which is, I suppose, just one of those things about making a movie 20 years after the first one. How is it that George C. Scott's character is in his early 60s back in 1974, and he's still in his early 60s in 1990? And his uh, child, uh, daughter is still in, it looks like she's college age. Uh, you know, Ed Flanders certainly seems like a man who's an aged version of, uh, what's his name, Ma- O'Malley. Uh, Bill O'Malley, yeah. Right? Uh, but I guess they just said, look, we're going to do this movie and Lieutenant Kinderman is going to be the, the main character. He has to stay at the same age because otherwise he wouldn't be on the police force anymore if he was in his 80s, right? Well, yeah, and he's supposed to be, I mean, he's written as much older in Legion, in the book. Um, But, you know, for my money, recasting Reverend O'Malley with Ed Flanders and recasting, you know, Lee J. Cobb had died. So you have George C. Scott, which I think is actually, you know, it's actually kind of brilliant because a few years later, um, there was a remake of 12 Angry Men. And it was directed by William Friedkin and the Lee J. Cobb role was played by George C. Scott. I just think that's, it's very super cool. Um, But regardless of all of that, you can get away with these peripheral characters and the exorcist being recast. But that moment when we see patient X revealed in light and we are supposed to instinctively go, holy shit, how is that Father Karras? It, it doesn't work if that's a recast. And Blatty shot all of these, you know, little bits and pieces um, that were in the original cut. You had, you know, a restaurant that they attend on George. There was a, supposed to be a photograph of Karras on the wall and it's Brad Dourif, you know, in a Karras role. Um, You know, a couple of little bits and bobs like that. And at this point, the only thing that survives in The Exorcist 3, it's a blink and you miss it shot during um, 
Kinderman's bizarre dream where he's at the, uh, you know, the subway or the train station going from life to the afterlife. And there's a shot of Karras as Brad Dourif inside a bell jar uh, with his hands up and his wings sort of folded in this jar, sort of symbolizing that he's trapped, you know, here on earth. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work though, when he, you know, raises his head, reveals himself in a straitjacket, and the audience is left to ask, well, who the fuck is this? Well, what the question I would ask is if uh, Blatty was so interested in making something that was separate and distinct from the exorcist, and he felt that the important relationship is Lieutenant Kinderman, Father Dyer, and the Gemini killer, why bring Father Karras into the picture at all? Why isn't this a story about Lieutenant Kinderman uh, investigating the Gemini killer who has, is in league with demons and can make the low ladies crawl on the ceiling? Why isn't that the story? <laughs> well, yeah. I asked him point blank, you know, I, I, I and I, I think I was probably the first person who ever asked him this question because when I said it, he looked so dumbfounded and then a little bit pissed off and mm -hmm then got very peevish. And the question was, okay, if the story of the exorcist is saying that if there are demons, then there are perhaps angels. And if, you know, all of the evil in the world, um, you know, demonstrates that there is a, an adversary, then all the good that happens, um, you know, clearly underlines the fact that there is a supreme power of goodness. So at the end, God works through Karis who decides that he is going to sacrifice his physical self and, and suicide is a sin for Catholics. So by drawing the demon into himself and then throwing himself from the Prospect Street residence window down the Hitchcock stairs and dying, um, he saves this little girl and her family. And now we have been, you know, demonstrated, you know, that God is real. God has worked through Karis. He's renewed his faith. He is now going to go on to his heavenly reward. So how is it then that if God is good and God is just, that God then allows Pazuzu to slip the Gemini killer into Karis's body, therefore keeping him a prisoner inside his physical form with his brain reduced to mush stuck anonymously in a straight jacket in a psych ward for 15, 16, 17, however many of the actual years are supposed to be because they say 15 in the movie, but it was 17 since the original Exorcist came out. How is that fulfilling the promise that, or, or Blatty's thesis in the original film? And he was so baffled by that that he got incredibly pissed off because he realized that he had sort of undermined his entire idea. Yeah, but you know, it also just this all this discussion about uh, this complicated crap about uh, the Gemini killer being uh, possessed by demons or in league with demons, and 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 also Father Karras being in there. I mean, it just shows what an important influence William Friedkin was. If you read the original book and you read all of those passages when Father Damien is talking to Demon Reagan, and they go on and on and on, and it's like James Bond talking to Blofeld, and Friedkin must have looked at that and said, this isn't going to fly. I mean, I haven't seen the screenplay that Friedkin rejected from Blatty. Did he show that to you? It's very, very different. It's a lot more like The Exorcist 3. There's just so much heavy-handed symbolism everywhere. And yeah, it's, it, it goes on. Those conversations go on and on, just like in the book. And with Karis justifying so many of the, you know, what he considers natural sort of phenomenon based on the fact that, oh, you know, she's not a demon. Reagan is just, you know, reading my mind and pulling the answers to, you know, the Latin questions I'm asking her. She's just reading my mind and I'm going, wait, wait a minute, how that, I'm really glad Freakton got that stuff because it was kind of yeah. silly even in well, 71. I will admit that I, I went back to the book expecting it to be a howler. You know, I thought it would stink because after all, he's not regarded as one of our literary giants. Uh, and in a way, I came up, uh, came along back with a different feeling. I have a respect for him as a writer because I think some of the things that he's doing are actually very clever if you have the agenda he has. Sure. As an evangelist for an idea, he picked an extraordinarily sophisticated and clever way 
because he makes you, if you're, even if you're a non-believer, he makes you come along with him and reach the same conclusion. He sets up, he has like pages of discussion of uh, different types of theories of why this might be happening. She's got a brain lesion. She's got uh, various psychological problems. And what he's doing is he's sort of building this bulletproof case for exorcism, for demonic possession and exorcism. He forces the reader to say at a certain point, yes, she's possessed by the devil. There's only one thing you can do, and that's exercise her. And that's important because there's a lot, if they had just jumped to the exorcism right at the beginning, there'd be a lot of people saying, oh, wait a minute, she's not really possessed. Why don't you send it to the doctor first? Why don't you get a psychiatrist? Uh, so that was very clever of him, I think. He anticipated Absolutely. every argument against demonic possession. He anticipated and he put it to rest. But from my perspective, the value of the first film is that it's uh, a, a be beautifully made film technically. It's a very powerful film. And it can even make people who find Blatty's message to be, ugh, to, I still think it's a great film, you know? I mean, I find his ideas to be ridiculous and, and unsophisticated and backward. And even the idea in Exorcist 3 that he's basically saying that serial killers, I, I assume this is what he's saying, serial killers aren't uh, doing horrible things because they are mentally ill. He's saying they got devils in them. And then if you sat and chat with them, they'll come up with all this sort of cackling villainy dialogue. That stuff is, you know, that closes out of town as far as I'm concerned. And actually, they did a theater version of this in Chicago of Exorcist 3. I would love to see that. I would love to see how that plays in front of an audience because uh, that sort of heavy-handed stuff, to, for me, I think that that's the stuff that the, the younger generation should be laughing at. I don't think they should be laughing at the first film. Well, I would recommend reading Legion. The stage play that you're referring to was based on the book rather than any incarnation of the film or any of the screenplays that were written. And the book, I, I'd really be interested in your take because uh, considering that you found the original Exorcist novel to have a lot of value due to a lot of the, the narrative tricks and, and, and the procedural sort of quality to it, Legion does not read the same way. Legion is rather, it's, it's probably about 60% an internal monologue where Kinderman is pondering the um, problem of evil and trying to sort of justify how there can be a God in the world with all the terrible things that happen. And what you see in the film is, is only a very small percentage of this book. It is really Blatty using what was a very thin skeleton of a story. Um, to further evangelize, but to a much greater degree. It's a it's well, a tough read. It's a very tough read. Well, it wasn't a big success, and I understand he had to actually sue the New York Times for not including it on the New York Times bestseller. <laughs> um, you are absolutely attention. right about that. You are <laughs> absolutely right. That's not a good sign. <laughs> well, since we have two directors on here, I want to get your guys' opinion on um, William's... Uh, his, the way he directed the first exorcist with the con, you know, because there was a lot of controversy with the shooting the gun, right? Physically, you know, physically hitting actors. Um, yeah. Well, I tell you, I don't think uh, that that's the sort of thing that you could do today. So even if we like the idea, I don't think we anybody would allow us to get away with it. There is an <laughs> argument to be made that as long as you have the acceptance of the actors, that you can use tr tricks like that. I mean, he wasn't firing a loaded gun. I assume it was a gun with blanks in it. Uh, I don't think the actors even today, uh, Ellen Burstyn certainly doesn't seem to be uh, recalling those things with fondness, especially since she came away with a permanent back injury, apparently. Um, but the, uh, I don't think they're really useful techniques, but the fact that he had to resort to that is an indication of he was going for complete realism, and he knew he couldn't, there was nothing else he could do to trick the actor into giving a, a, a realistic performance in those situations. When he slapped O'Malley to get the proper reaction when he was uh, holding Damien's hand at the end and giving him the uh, last rites, that's a very powerful scene. And it works because his hand is shaking. You can see the emotion in him at that moment. That's something that a, a relatively inexperienced actor would probably not have been able to do. Well, so, I know that Jason Miller had complained about the gun because he thought you know i'm an actor let me act 
Uh, Eric, what do you think about a director thinking, well, I need to help these actors along in this way and not just letting them act? Well, first of all, it's interesting that Jason Miller says, you know, I'm an actor, just let me act, because he wasn't an actor. He was a playwright. He was a director. <laughs> and one of the brilliant things that Friedkin did was he cast these very, very talented, very experienced um, actors like Lee J. Cobb. And, you know, Ellen Burstyn was still on the way up, but she, she was and is a class act. Um, but then he populated this film with, you know, newcomers like Linda Blair, you know, Reverend Bill O'Malley, just, you know, listen to his title. The, the man was not an actor. He, he had Catholic priests playing themselves in this film. And for whatever reason, saw a production of that championship season that um, Jason Miller had written and directed. And upon seeing this, decided he wanted the guy sight unseen who directed this play to play Damien Karras. Whatever weird, bizarre antenna that he had that was sending, you know, that was receiving signals from God or Saturn or whatever, Friedkin made a masterpiece by making incredibly unconventional choices. And whether that was casting uh, non-actors or firing off blanks or hitting priests across the face, I mean, it was, it was the wild, wild west of filmmaking at that time. It, it was the collapse of the studio system and you had Friedkin and De Palma and Scorsese and Coppola and Lucas and Milius and all of these film school guys who were coming in and breaking all the rules. People who were accustomed to making films like we are with scotch tape and popsicle sticks and very, very small budgets, having to come up with unique and creative ways to tell unique and creative stories. It's just that now, instead of scotch tape and popsicle sticks, they had money, they had cranes, they had, you know, Panavision. They, they were able to apply all of those film school techniques with a Hollywood budget. And so my feeling is, and it's been said by a billion directors before me, it sucks today, but film is forever. And when those actors and when that crew signed on and said, we're going to be working all day for months and months in a refrigerated set, um, and we're going to be getting paid for it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have to like Friedkin personally, but the, the end product really speaks for itself. Yeah. And, and he isn't known as being a particularly lovely man. Nor, <laughs> nor was Blatty from what I understand. I don't see many people who was saying that he's the most loved. He's not like the Peter Cushing of film directors. He's not somebody that everybody came away with nice stories about. But the fact is, uh, while we would hope now we would find better ways, uh, less risky ways than firing a gun on a set, even a gun with blanks is dangerous. Uh, we could find, we could take that idea and find other ways to maybe uh, get a surprise out of our actors or put them in the proper frame of mind to give them the right emotional uh, cues uh, because that's the big problem uh, at least it's the problem that I had as a director is that I'm thinking that the actor is my collaborator in telling the story so I'm approaching them with uh, well you should do it this way because I want to achieve a certain effect later in the movie and it won't I can't I got to set it up for that or or maybe the people won't understand unless you say it a certain way that's the actors can't use that actors need you to tell them the emotion of the scene right that's what the director has to convey how do I feel in this scene because the way you feel is the way you're going to act and so he had his techniques maybe it didn't make him very popular maybe there are people that, of the surviving cast that still have their resentments. But I, I, like I say, when I watched, watched the first half of that movie just by itself, there's so many scenes in it where I'm, on, I'm in awe of what he was able to achieve. And it is him. And it's one of those strange instances where a director, they had their finger on the pulse. And then with the very next movie, it was just like, what well, they went a step too far or they, they lost their way. And he never made, as far as I can see, a film that comes anywhere near The Exorcist. Uh, Billy, let me ask you a question. Whenever you said that the movie didn't scare you, but it, I guess, creeped you out. Yeah. When, when you watched as a kid, did you ever think I could actually be possessed? Like, did you think that that part of it was real or, uh, you know? No, no, not really. It just made me feel very uneasy. Just, it was, 
it was kind of like disturbing to me. Like the probably because of how the makeup was and the voice, her running down the stairs all backwards or whatever that creeped the sh- creeps the hell out of me. <laughs> Aaron, what and about you? Like, Whenever you first saw it, what did you? What were like your first initial thoughts on it? Um, man, I, I, I just, I just in love with the. Yeah. Uh, He's cutting it out there. You're cutting out, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of my favorite um, horror movies. <laughs> Yeah, you were, you there? were yeah, you were cutting it <laughs> out there. Um oh, okay. well, I'll say this, like I don't remember the first time that I seen it. Um, but I know I seen it as a kid. And then of course I I remember watching it again when they come out with the I guess what you called it, the version you've ever seen. That's what now my qu- yeah, now my question is in the original cut, did they have the flashes of <laughs> they or was that ju- or was that just in the version you've ever seen? They yes did have, and no. Yes, and like no. in the kitchen. I remember seeing the no, one in the, the kitchen. kitchen. No, that that that's an example of the horrible things that okay. he added in. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's ridiculous, right? The devil is not into branding. He's not going to put his face on a refrigerator. Uh, the the Pazuzu face or the demon face was they people called it a subliminal cut. It isn't really a subliminal cut because you can see it. But those flashes at, at various points in the movie when it's over people's faces, like I think. There's a brief shot of the uh, a, b- a brief glimpse of the Pazuzu face over the the wino in the subway. Am I about right about that? Eric? No, you only see th- you get the flash during Karis's dream about his mother um, calling for help and descending uh, into the subway. And which, then that, that was a scene, creepy scene. Just yeah. the her, just the her standing in the street there to me was creepy. That is the most effective nightmare scene that I have ever seen, and a lot of that has to do with the sound design and the way that all of the, you know, ambient sound is very much um, pushed into the background and in the foreground. We're hearing Jason Miller breathing and mumbling in his sleep. It, it's incredible. Uh, but you see that flash during his dream of the, the death mask face. And then that shot is revisited later on during the exorcism. It appears over Linda Blair's face. Um, but all of the other things that you're referring to, there's a shot um, during a, a previously deleted sequence uh, where Reagan is receiving her first medical exam. It appears there. Um, the shot where it appears in the kitchen over Ellen Burstyn's shoulder. There, on, some on, of the, the, on the top of the oven, is it? On the, on yes, the, I believe yes. So, yeah. The devil it, has to find better places <laughs> to put his face. You know. And here's the weird part, that there were actually, and this is another Star Wars special edition sort of illusion, because when the film was released in 2000 in the cinema and then was released on DVD, Uh, There were all of these changes and all of these subliminals that have been added in. And then when it was issued for the first time on Blu-ray, and unlike George Lucas, William Friedkin allowed both versions of the film to coexist, the version you've never seen has now had some of those elements removed. I noticed that. You you can only see them on the 2000 DVD, but it it was very surreal. I watched The Exorcist with Blatty and he was not aware of some of those elements that had been added in. There was in particular, there was a terrible shot where Ellen Burstyn opens Linda Blair's bedroom door Mm -hmm. and you get this flash. It looks like a glow in the dark uh, Spencer's gifts uh, poster of Pazuzu's (laughs) face on the back of the door. And then as there's a wide shot and we're seeing down the hallway out the bedroom door as Ellen Burstyn leaves the room and then goes down the stairs and in the corner of Reagan's bedroom, the statue from Iraq of, of, of Pazuzu appears in the corner and then fades away. And I had to point those things out to Vladdy. He, he didn't know they were there. And I well, was it's, like, it's, it's too bad you did. I can't imagine that eased his mind. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you should I was have like, let yeah, him but they're... pass without knowing these terrible <laughs> things. I was, I was at least relieved to be able to say, well, but they're not on the Blu-ray now. Well, so, I, I noticed that some of the things came out because that face on the wall had always bothered me. I, I thought, God forbid, uh, Re- Reagan had had like a hang in there kitty poster on the wall. We would have seen the Damon. <laughs> But the, um, the, I noticed that there was one edition on the Blu-ray that I hadn't seen before. Maybe I just didn't notice it. 
But seeing his mother's face on the window just before yes. he jumps out, that's new, right? No, that, that was always in the, or always it, was, it was always the version you've never seen. That wasn't okay. added to the Blu-ray. That was yeah, for some 2000. reason. I'm, <clears throat> for some reason, I'm also thinking that whenever, um, whenever he takes the demon in from her, I'm thinking that it flashed the Pazuzu one over his face too when that happened, when he got... Well, well he, takes on a, he takes on a d demon look and he sort of alternates between the demon look and I haven't checked this because uh, the, the version that I have in my mind now is the most recent one, the Blu-ray version. It seems to me that in past versions, he jumps out the window when he has the demon look, the idea being that the demon is in him and, he, and then he jumps. When I watched it last night, it looked like he flashes back to himself before he jumps, which might be them suggesting that he wasn't really successful, that he killed himself and the demon wasn't really in him. So in the original theatrical cut, it was a jump cut. You see a low angle shot of Jason Miller as he's rearing back and he has this you know, evil look on his face and then it does a jump cut um, where he no longer looks evil and he screams no, and then we cut to him jumping out the window. And that was on, that was the original theatrical presentation, VHS, DVD. When the film uh, had its 25th anniversary release in 1998, that jump cut was smoothed. Oh, yeah. the, the transition was changed, so it looks more like a, sort of like a morph, oh. and that's the way that it's been ever since. But he Fair. still, in, in both cases, he was, he didn't, was not in the demonic, he, he, he was not in the demonic state when he jumped. Correct. Okay. So Billy, that, what do you think? Was that always their was that always their idea? <laughs> I, I I think it was supposed to be I mean on Friedkin's part it was supposed to be ambiguous and that just okay. pissed bloody off to no well, end so of it. It, is it would make sense if you wanted to say that he really just killed himself and didn't really accomplish what he wanted to do. He didn't take the demon with him. He killed himself and the demon just sort of went off elsewhere. Because in the book they make a point of saying that once you exercise a demon it can't go back into the same victim. Uh, so if he got the, the demon out of her, and even if it was in himself, and then it left him, then conceivably, following their logic, he would be okay and she would be okay, and his suicide was unnecessary. I mean, it was unnecessary except for the sake of the drama. The Catholic priest has to become a martyr, so he has to kill himself one way or the other. As a matter of fact, in the book, uh, Father Marin tells uh, Chris McNeil that his name comes from the Catholic priest who worked with the lepers. Well, that Catholic priest ended up as a leper. Uh, so that was the idea behind the name. And he also mentions this, I don't know if this is something ever discussed with Blatty, the business of the head turning. In the book, he says that, uh, first of all, there's a, a, for, a fortune teller or a Gene Dixon type person that attends Chris McNeil's party, and she brings later a book about devil worship. And they suggest in it that Reagan has read the book and that she's gotten her ideas about Satanism or possession from the book. So the idea of twisting the heads, that comes from the fact that apparently back in olden times when exorcists would, were out you know, hunting for demons, the demons would occasionally assassinate them by twisting their heads around. So that sort of makes sense. The, the Reagan is possessed by a demon. She twists this guy's head around. She throws him out the window. But then in one of his endless dialogue scenes, one of his little, you know, chats with the, with the Reagan demon, he has Reagan, the demon say, oh, no, we didn't twist his head. He just, when he went out the window, you know, his head got twisted around. I have to admit, I can't figure out why he would write that. The, I think for the same reason that the, the demon originally says, I'm the devil, and then the next day says to Karis, I was just pulling your leg. I'm not really the devil. I'm some, we're a whole multitude right. of devils in here. And so the, you know, the whole thing that Marin says about, you know, he's a liar, but more dangerously and psychologically, he'll mix lies with the truth. Right. Um, and that's, well, that's guess, how he keeps you off guard. That sort of makes sense. But if I was, I mean, we're assuming that Blatty thinks that this is a devil or demons under the control of the devil. If you're sitting there and the priest says, did you twist that guy's head and throw him out the window? He says, oh, no, no, that's not us. We didn't do that. I would say, yeah, we did that and we're going to do the same to you. I mean, that would really put a nice brick in the back of his pants, right? If you're trying to scare <laughs> people. Yeah, right? for real. Say, just undo these straps and I'll show you how it's done. 
But that by that same strong. token, he also, you know, the, the, the demon allows itself to be sprinkled with tap water and reacts as if it's holy water, right. which you go, okay, that's a ploy. But also allows itself to be recorded on tape at the same time, speaking in English in reverse, but English in reverse that is also dropping clues about the exorcist it wants to do battle with and its fear mm -hmm. of being cast out of the body because without a neurological functional system, these, these shapeless beings cannot touch the material world. So it, it's, I think that there's a lot of ambiguity there on purpose and why did the demon say this and why did the demon do that um, that has us here, you know, 40 some odd years later talking about it. Well, that's true enough. I, but I have to admit, I'm glad that he, that Treat can cut that stuff out because- Absolutely, uh, yes. Certainly wouldn't have made the, more, the film more effective. It does, and but some stuff that I would have loved to have seen along the lines of that ambiguity you're talking about, and the you mentioned the the Mary Jo Spencer, I believe her name is, the girl who brings the the book on demonology over. It also fills in some blanks that the film does not fill in, such as the desecration in uh, Dahlgren Chapel, which is you know right across the street. If you've ever been to Georgetown, the university really is right there within walking distance, and there were other incidents that occurred in the book, such as, you know, human excrement being found on the altar and, you know, um, profane messages that were written on altar cards um, using Sharon, the, the governess, her, her typewriter. All these things that indicated that Reagan was slipping out of the house after dark mm -hmm. and doing these, these things that Kinderman was investigating. And for my money, the one allusion to that is the most frightening scene in the film. And that is when Kinderman is watching the house from his parked car and looks up at the bedroom window and you get this shot of a shadow gliding past the window, which in just one two second shot suggests she's, she's playing possum. She can get out of those straps anytime she wants. Right. What's happening when the house is quiet at night? Is she sneaking around the house? Is she leaving the house? What things is she doing? That to me is the most terrifying thing in the film. Yeah, that was a that certainly was an effective shot. Uh, the uh, the spider walk thing, I've always sort of objected to because I think it breaks one of the rules of the film, which is the devil doesn't want to take her around the house. He doesn't want to take her around the neighborhood because if he did that, he would be forcing them to take the decision of putting her away. He, sure. prefer, he prefers to keep her in the room and let them come to, to her, right? See, they, I think that scene there, that scene was more shock value. I think it kind of, it didn't fit like the narrative of the movie. It was just there for it's shock out of, the audience. out of style of the rest of the yeah. film. You know? because a lot and of it's people clearly say, not Linda Blair as well. Yeah, oh, correct, right. yeah. She has this sort of <laughs> sinewy neck that Linda Blair certainly doesn't have. Uh, but um, the devil would want them to come to the child because that creates in them a greater feeling of despair. They have to take care of this child. And I think one of the themes of, of this movie, and it's a theme that actually was in several influential horror movies around the time, I think it's a little bit, you can see it in Jaws as well, is the pain that people feel when the, the innocent, weak people that are put in their trust, they can't defend. Uh, the mother can't figure out a way to help her child. The priest can't figure out a way to help his elderly mother. Same priest can't find a way to help all these priests, these other priests that are having a crisis of faith. All these children that have been put in our care and they're all being pulled away from us by monsters. And that's the great, when I watch the film, the thing that strikes me, the, the absolutely the star player, the most valuable player is Ellen Burstyn because you see the anguish and the horror in her face. There's that scene in when Lieutenant Kinderman comes fairly late in the movie, when he comes to f continue the discussion. And he, sa he said, she says at a certain, certain point, do you want a cup of coffee? And rather irritatingly, he says, yes. So she has to get up with the cups and walk into the kitchen and her hands are shaking. And you look at the expression on her face and it's just, it's, it, it's more horrifying than a lot of the things that are actually considered shock scenes in the movie, in my opinion. Uh, uh, Peter Blatty's, William Peter Blatty's problem, I think, is that he had this particular 
thing that he was pushing all the time, that his idea of heaven is sort of an all-male world where everybody will sit around and uh, quote, quote uh, S.J. Perlman or quote the Bible or quote uh, old Marx Brothers movies, you know, have some scotch, we'll smoke, and the women will all be in the kitchen, right? And in The Exorcist Three, that's really true. I mean, you look at the, the women in that movie, there's nobody who has any agency at all, right? They're either weird creatures like that nurse with, who can't put on the lipstick. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I assume he made her weird because it was sort of a, a uh, rather primitive attempt to make her the red herring of the story that people would think that she's the murderer or she's the one that's being possessed by the Gemini killer. And if you notice, she's wearing a red sweater through the entire movie, so she's a literal red herring. Yeah, a little red herring, <laughs> yes. And the, and the other women in the film are either his... Uh, uh, family, and they're always seen in the kitchen, it seems. Uh, the, Zara Lambert, who's a wonderful actress in her own right, she spends all her time over the sink uh, or over the stove. And I never the, thought of this. <laughs> and yeah, Zora they, Lambert they, is dubbed. It's not yes, her voice. Yes, I noticed that. Was she suffering some, some sort of vocal problem? Or she had a throat problem or something? Uh, from what I was told, that was a studio decision. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's oh, unfortunate. Wow. It really takes a lot away from the realism of that scene. You would think the one thing that you could do right in a fairly big budget movie is get a scene with a guy talking with his family. You know, that shouldn't be that hard, right? And right from the beginning of the scene, when George, George C. Stott comes in the door, she's talking in a dubbed voice. He's obviously been booped. And he hasn't set the scene up so that you can see that there's another person in the room. So he has to do this sort of awkward cut to the mother-in-law and she sort of nods her head just so you know she's there she's not nodding in time to anything that's being said really uh and you know it just is not not well done and i think that's the big problem he really wasn't a director and he couldn't get freakin apparently to i understand freakin was interested originally they talked about him doing uh, exorcist 3. he had a million and one reasons for deciding he didn't want to do it there's the the story of the half million dollar lunch where um, after the heretic was such a disaster, Warner Brothers came to, you know, they're, they're realizing we have a potential franchise here. This is post Star Wars. So they come to Freakin and Blatty and say, look, we will give you half a million dollars to have lunch with us and to pitch us an idea for an Exorcist sequel that you two will do together. If we like it, Boom. It can be one sentence. It can be a, a two hour long pitch. If we like it, we'll sign you right there. And if we don't like it, you get a half million dollars to split and we walk away. And so apparently Bill Blatty comes up with the concept that we now know as Legion, uh, The Exorcist Three, and he pitches it to Friedkin and Friedkin goes, I love it. It's fantastic. And they hook up with Jerry Weintraub, who's going to be their producer. And the three of them are all set to go have this lunch the next day. And freaking literally at the 11th hour calls Blatty up and says, I don't want to do it. And he cited all these reasons. He was like, you know, I had done cruising and cruising was, you know, was very subversive. And that was a bad experience for me. And Jason Miller has, you know, a, a, an escalating drinking problem. And it, it seemed to really come down to the fact that, again, uh, victim of its success, he knew that no sequel was ever going to be The Exorcist again. And so he backed out. And according to Blatty, there were numerous times over the ensuing decade where Blatty would go back to Friedkin and go, hey, are you sure you don't want to do this? Because it seemed that the only way that any studio was going to go with Legion as a film was if Friedkin was going to direct it. And Friedkin always said no. I understand that John Carpenter was also approached at one point, and he turned, was. Turned, yeah. I can't. This he is. He had a very, very specific. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say I, I have a, a fantasy. Uh, it, it's not based on anything, but my impression is that Friedkin, because of his experience with Blatty, and Carpenter, because of his brief experience in discussing the project with him, they both said we don't want to do this because this guy is going to, I assume, be the producer or one of the producers of the film. And yes. they didn't want another 30 years or 50 years of debate with him about what should be taken out or put back in or who should be doing what or how it should be done. I mean, I find it hard to believe that if Freakin had done Exorcist Three, that it would have been as uh, uh, shapeless and, and uh, screwed up as it is. 
even with the addition of the possession scenes or the uh, uh, exorcism scenes, I think he probably would have found a way to get that story in shape so that it wasn't so sloppy. And the other thing about Blatty is he is a guy that uh, is an old time Hollywood screenwriter. He is famous before The Exorcist for writing the screenplay for A Shot in the Dark, a Peter, a Peter Sellers and Spectre Clouseau movie. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, his other claim to fame is that he apparently did a, some features with Shirley MacLaine. He knew Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine apparently was interested at one stage in doing The Exorcist. He based Chris McNeil on Shirley MacLaine, right? Right. She must, she must have taken as a great compliment. And it's McLean's daughter who's on the photo, uh, the right. cover of the original Exorcist uh, novel. I think I have it here. That's cool. She's hidden behind the uh, the thing there. Oh, that's her. She, I don't know. I don't know why he thought he could get away with that. But I don't know if she ever sued him or anything. But I mean, uh, he likes old time Hollywood banter, and all of his scenes, uh, including those wonderful scenes with C. Scott and Ed Flanders, where they play it perfectly, because those are the guys to do that. But it doesn't, it's not tonally correct for a movie of this kind. I mean, he's making us love these bantering old men like they're the Sunshine Boys. And the next minute, the guy's got his head cut off, for Christ's sake. <laughs> That's not the way a movie like this should work. That's, well, the I, audience I, if, is here, and then they're there, and then they're here, you know. If you know anything about Blatty's problems with the original film, the original Exorcist, you know, he, he had issues from, you know, prior to the film being released because apparently the version that we now know as the version you've never seen was the original assembly. And if you know anything about filmmaking, which I know you do, uh, your assembly is not the same thing as a director's cut. And it's, it is longer. It has so much superfluous content. And when Friedkin decided to chop those 11 minutes out, Blatty became such a pain in the ass being a producer as well as the screenwriter on that project that Friedkin had to have Blatty um, barred from the editing suite. And he wasn't allowed in. And when the film came out and audiences were misinterpreting the ending, due in part to that jump cut you mentioned, and were believing that Karras was not taking the demon into himself, asserting control of his own body before he could be used to murder Reagan and commit suicide by way of the window, Rather, audiences were thinking that the demon was causing Karras to commit defenestration, was killing him, was winning. And so Blatty was pitching all of these new endings that he and Friedkin would go and shoot. I and some about, of them... I, I heard about the one with Karras walking up the stairs like Jesus passing his apostles on the street. That sounds terrible. I mean, yes, and there was another one involving... Um, Father Dyer's character encountering a jogger down by the CNO Canal who gradually turns into Karis. In fact, Blatty was trying to get The Exorcist remade as a Fox miniseries in the late 90s. And I've read the script for that, and the ending is even more maudlin and involves a um, Dyer receiving a heavenly lemon drop because lemon drops are yeah. his favorite candy. Uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it's, it, it was not network TV ready. And I think what ultimately caused Blatty to pull the plug was the mm -hmm. fact that Fox was trying to insist on Queen Latifah as Kinderman. So yeah. at any rate, the point is that, that yes, Blatty was a guy who kept wanting to go back to that film and kept wanting to add new content and clarify things. And if you've ever seen his directorial debut, The Ninth Configuration, oh, that is that. also a movie that exists in about six or seven different cuts because he kept recutting the film. So he, yes, he would have been a pain in the ass if another person had been directing The Exorcist 3. But what you see with Carpenter is the exact same thing you would have seen with Friedkin. Because what Carpenter told me is he's like, oh, well, look, you know, I, I'm looking at the script and going, you need an exorcism at the end of The Exorcist 3. And Carpenter had these great ideas for, you know, he was like, I want to see um, representation of the demon underneath the skin. So I want to see during the exorcism what looks like snakes or whatever crawling underneath the skin. Uh, like there's another face that's that's trying to get out. And 
their brief conversations, it made it very apparent to, to, to Carpenter that he would be directing the film basically in name only because the deal that was set up with Morgan Creek was um, if it was going to be Blatty's name on the poster and it was going to be based on Blatty's pedigree and his novel, then he was going to be the screenwriter and he was going to be the producer and he was going to get final cut. And yes, that's why you end up with this film that seems to be looking over its shoulder at what Blatty had done prior to The Exorcist, because The Exorcist in many ways killed his career as a comedy writer. And so it was almost like he was trying to say to everybody, I'm using The Exorcist 3 as a backdoor pilot for um, resuscitating my career as a comedy writer, while still putting it in a horror sort of well, those you know, scenes are system. Those scenes are charming, and I think, uh, Gary, uh, uh, when you discussed this, uh, I think there was general agreement that th you love those scenes, right? Everybody yeah, the, the scenes between George C. Scott and, I keep wanting to say Ned Flanders, but I know it's not <laughs> Ned Flanders. Um, I, I could have watched an entire movie of that, just those I, I two wish, characters. I, I wish it had been <laughs> that, right? I mean, that would have been wonderful. Uh, but the the unfortunate thing is, and this is true with the ninth configuration as well, that sometimes people who have, you know, it's what, what's the, the Dunning-Kruger effect? It's the people who don't know what they know or are certain that they know it or whatever. They don't know what they know, what, what they don't know. They're ignorant of their own ignorance. And he seems to be completely convinced that to make an effective horror movie, you have to have these, this sort of like opening sh uh, show, this little comedy routine first that that's a way to get the p audience to sympathize with the characters, to make them lo lovable, and to have this sort of banter. And to be honest with you, as a comedy writer, some of that banter is pretty stale shit. <laughs> In that one scene with a nurse, another sort of brainless woman, uh, that's, they have one conversation where a sort of brainless woman approaches them as a waitress, right, uh, and asks if they want a drink. And then they have a, they're in the hospital and a brainless woman comes in mistaking the room. She's in the wrong room. She's looking for Schwartz. And that sets the line of jokes off, right? Oh, Schwartz, uh, you know. May the Schwartz be with you. May the Schwartz right. be with you. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> terrible? And wasn't, uh, wasn't Spaceballs already out at that time? <laughs> Three years, yeah. And he, and he tries to do two on a match. He says, go in peace, my child, and then may the Schwartz be with you. Any editor, I don't know who edited that movie, maybe he did. Any editor would say, Bill, one. <laughs> I'll get away with two. And it doesn't even make sense that he would say, uh, uh, go in peace, my child, because the whole point of the scene is she doesn't know he's a priest. If she knows he's a priest, she wouldn't be calling him Mr. Schwartz, right? So it doesn't make any sense that he would use that gag. He wouldn't get a response from her. She would just think he's a crazy old man. Well, I got to throw out there, not to cut you off, but... Blatty fired the original editor. Oh, yeah. he, he fired the editor of the film and he brought someone else in to do it at the end. So you and, mean our, our chance of having May the Schwartz Be With You cut out was lost? When that <laughs> I, I believe it was. And he, he in fact, one of the, the, the beliefs that the editor had was that the reason he was fired was the fact that, and, and, the editor is very, very generous. Um, Todd Ramsey, when he discusses his involvement with the film, um, he has mentioned a few things in such a way that suggests that Blatty very much a novice when knowing what to do with the camera and that, you know, anybody out there that's listening right now or watching this uh, that has any idea with what the 180 degree rule is or what is commonly referred to as the action axis it's the way that cameras are situated in order to shoot dialogue scenes so that you know the t the the space that each character is occupying at any given time blatty was apparently breaking that rule repeatedly which was making it very very difficult to edit a lot of these very very long dialogue scenes and the, the thing that was the tipping point was the fact that at the beginning of the film, we see a flashback to the final moments of The Exorcist or the, or the climax of the film in which Father Karras is falling down the Hitchcock stairs. And in the original movie, the stuntman threw himself down the stairs, 
and they had to shoot that sort of in pieces. And if you've ever been to the steps, it has several landings going down. It, it, I mean, those steps are almost vertical. It is a very, very frightening thing and can give you vertigo. But nonetheless, there are opportunities. These landings are built there in part to make sure that anybody that falls isn't going to go all the way down. So it's edited in such a way in The Exorcist that you never see the stunt man go down in one continuous shot. In The Exorcist 3, Blatty was very proud that he was able to get a stunt guy to take the dive and go all the way to the bottom. And they linger on a static shot of the guy rolling down. And it, if you're looking and paying attention, it becomes a little bit obvious that w what you'll see done for you know comedy in something like the, the Princess Bride, where the, the stunt people are clearly propelling themselves <laughs> down the hill. Um, you're seeing that in The Exorcist 3. And right before the stunt guy hits bottom, we go to a much tighter shot. And it's also apparent that the stunt guy is covering his face as he's going down because he is not Jason Miller. Right. And that pissed Blatty off so much that his beautiful one take master had this one second or one and a half second insert at the very, very end that that was what caused him to fire his editor. Hmm. Now I wanna go back to, cause I had some thoughts today about the original and um, the kind of two things. So like if this movie had came out today you could easily say that the meta, that it was a metaphor for, let's say, mental illness, right? Instead of you know the the, the, well, the, the, the exorcism, the possession, and all that, she was just I, mentally. If it Ill. was done today, or do you think that you think that that's what he was doing then? I don't know if that's what he was trying to say, but I think if it came out today, you could definitely say that. And then my other thing, real quick, is the the parents were divorced. And I think that there was the with the um, the priest being sort of father figures at the end of the movie. Whenever she sees the priest and she recognizes the collar, right. and I was wondering, what, would you think there was some kind of like undertone about you know father figures and all that? And then and then plus the mental illness. Well, you think it's a mental illness thing? Part of Blatty's uh, view of the world is that uh, the reason why the devil. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is very similar in this respect. They're kind of interesting books because they share certain things. There's superficial similarities, but there are also thematic similarities. But one of the things that Bram Stoker and uh, William Peter Blatty might have agreed on is that Ill evil isn't in us good British folks. We're great folks, you know. Uh, evil comes from over there. It infects us. Our only fault is when we leave the window open. And in Chris McNeil's house, there are all sorts of things that, according to Blatty, are opportunities for evil to get in, right? Her assistant, according to the book, is interested in Eastern philosophy and things like that. The child is allowed to play with a Ouija board. Well, we know, going back at least to the 30s, there were people in the Catholic Church, Christians in general, that said the Ouija board is, you know, the gateway or the pathway to, to evil. Uh, Ouija board, incidentally, is Ouija is owned by Hasbro. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are some folks who got, you know, pretty screw I screwy ideas about this. But in, in his, he was right to put that in because he was doing this sort of slow uh, stepping towards the idea of uh, uh, the shock scenes, the, the obvious uh, instances of demonic possession. You couldn't start that at full force. You had to do little things. Uh, apparently the rats in the attic, right? That's something everybody's had the experience with. So you say, okay, well, that's like the first little step. Something's funny, fu funny is going on. We're hearing funny sounds. Then the next thing is the business with the Ouija board, the business with her candle flaming up when she's in the attic. And I thought the Ouija board, uh, the planchette moving away from Linda Blair and the f uh, candle fla flaring up, those were uh, interesting because it seemed like the filmmaker was allowing us to see stuff that the characters were sort of ignoring. Maybe they wanted to ignore. If she had been in the attic and the flame from the candle had practically reached the ceiling, she would have stopped and said, what the fuck is going on? There's something strange. <laughs> See, uh, he, I would have left as... right then and there. What, <laughs> right, what he does very cleverly is immediately have her distracted by Carl coming in the attic. And so in her mind, she's 
she's not even going to think about what happened with the candle. She's thinking, oh, it must have been just because I was scared by, by call suddenly appearing. And the business with the planchette is very obviously moving by itself. And she chooses not to see that. So what, and it's good that she doesn't because it's not, it's not the time in the movie yet when the character should recognize that the devil is afoot. But, yeah, I always took that as the, the, the candle was um, hitting a cobweb and the, the, the cobweb is exploding into flame. That's how I always took that. I'll have to go back um, and watch it. I, I might have missed it. And, and th there's nothing that is, you know, specifically showing to indicate that. That was always just my interpretation of the scene because otherwise it is just a flame exploding on the end of a candle. The planchette, I think, I, that was something I always debated over and I felt that that was very clever editing because that shot that that sort of you know Chris Chris's perspective looking down on the planchette and the way that um, it flicks away from her hand to Reagan's could have been interpreted in any number of ways and could have simply have been um, Reagan you know twisting a wrist and it sli I mean you, if you've ever used a Ouija board which I think most of us probably have you know it's very light on the board. I don't um, use it because apparently if you use it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that, and that's the thing with The Exorcist. The, I, I think that it works better. This is a rare occasion where I think it works better as a film than as a book. Um, and that is in part because Blatty's evangelical message is tempered by Friedkin. And that going back to the original question, I mean, I think that all of those things that we're referring to, you know, the the sort of embracing the, you know, priestly, saintly figures at the end, that sort of Catholic iconography, that, that was all Blatty's intent. You know, this is a story about, um, again, if we don't want to even look at it as allegory, as one-to-one -one allegory for what was happening in the world at the time, it is about um, the sort of secular world being one that is having a corrosive effect on the family unit. This is about um, the collapse of traditional family values. You have a woman who has chosen to leave her husband in, you know, if it's the book, it's 71. If it's the film, it's 73. This is a, a modern woman with a, you know, she's cut her hair. She wears her hair short. Um, that's not something we do. And she's walking around in pants in every scene. Uh, also, she's head of, also in the book, she's just getting ready to direct her own film. She's getting ready to direct her own film. And she has... We don't allow that. <laughs> she's the head of household. She's not having to take money from her ex-husband. She is fully self-supportive. And she has hired another woman to live in the house and teach her daughter instead of being there. She's not cooking meals for the family. She has servants to do that. And she's working all day. She's putting her career first. And her daughter is essentially, um, metaphorically or, or literally, raped by an invasive outside presence and the only way to save this family is to turn attention back to where it should have been in the first place and that is the church that is traditional religious values and at the end um that recognition that that embracing of the catholic iconography and religion's place its importance in our world that, that, that's Blatty's message. And it's not one I get behind, which is partly it's, why I prefer the film. Yes, and, and the, uh, that time, that period in film history, most of the other films that were really uh, critically and commercially uh, well-received all sort of took the God is dead position. Uh, for Blatty to come along and, and give this very good message to a lot of people that evil isn't in you, evil comes from outside, that's something that people were ready to embrace. And it's, it's, it's worth noting that apparently after the success of The Exorcist, uh, there was a tremendous influx of men signing up for the priesthood. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing because priests, guys signing up for the priesthood with the expectation that every day I'm going to be battling the devil 
instead of doing the sort of miserable shit that priests probably have to do, like <laughs> sticking a dollar bill in the mm -hmm. wino's pants pocket in the subway, that leads to bad things. In a way, you could say that the exorcist is the work of the devil, as some evangelists tried to claim at the time, because it led people in the wrong direction. How, many, how much of the satanic panic of the 80s is due to movies like The Exorcist and The Omen and Rosemary's Baby? Rosemary's Baby, I'll leave on itself because that's a sort of social satire. But still, those ideas that witches and cultists are among us and we have to protect our children, that's why we got the McMartin preschool uh, situation, right? That's and absolutely why we got the satanic panic, because you see all the copycat films in part, uh, not just The Omen, but all of the, you know, the spaghetti um, demon films, uh, all, you know, the black exploitation yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah you you had all of these, you know, based on true events right. books that were coming out and then being turned into films. You had opportunistic people like Ed and Lorraine Warren who were going to these gullible families who couldn't mm -hmm. afford their, their mortgage and said, okay, we're going to turn your house into a haunted house and it's going to be based on a true story, right. same way The Exorcist was based on a true story. And then you end up with all of these films and, and you know, all of this content that's out there. It just, none of it has Blatty's sort of message, whether you approve of that message or you don't. It was simply, it, it was schlock designed to entertain and to scare it, and it worked on that level the, but you're absolutely right in the same way they, the the x-files sort of tenderized society so that we're now in a position where nobody ever believes anything it, you know everything's a conspiracy the government sure. is always in the wrong all those guys black, driving around in black cars they're all controlling the world and they're doing it apparently to sell us out to aliens that whole thing <laughs> is the result of these movies and these tv shows and I can't think that William Peter Blatty was pleased to hear that The Exorcist 3 was like... Jeffrey Dahmer's favorite movie. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that says more, and it, and it brings it right back around to Blatty's intent. Human beings are in search of meaning and purpose in what many would argue is a meaningless and purposeless existence. Um, we are searching for destiny. We are looking for signs in the sky. And there are a lot of people who could make the argument that religion and belief systems exist to give us some sort of purpose where otherwise there is none. And so for people to be finding you know, if it's pareidolia in your entertainment and you're watching movies or watching TV shows and that is feeding your belief system, um, then you are using entertainment for the wrong reasons. Well, that, that may have been, that, that was the idea that he expressed to you as his uh, sort of philosophy on these things? No, What's I mean- your interpretation? That's my personal interpretation. Um, he was- he was proud of the film, but I think he was also a bit embarrassed by the film. Um, embarrassed by virtue of the fact that it seemed that audiences were, rather than running to their nearest church to be saved um, and baptized, they were instead wanting more of that roller coaster, that mm -hmm. experience that was The Exorcist. Well, I remember seeing The Exorcist when it came out. I may have, like yourself, seen it on, on its opening weekend. And I remember the reaction of the audience coming out of the theater. And it's kind of like the reaction of the audience coming out of the theater in the movie after they, Lieutenant Kinderman and, and uh, Father Dry see the movie, that sort of happy look on their face, like nothing happened. Well, we, we got to get you know home and have dinner. No, you look at the reaction of people coming out of the theater after The Exorcist. It's like they'd just been hit in the head with a ball-peen hammer. Uh, <laughs> there's... The, if his, I don't know what his message is other than simply we should believe that the devil is a real thing, a real force in the world, and that we have to be on God against it. And the best way to be on God is to, you know, go to church and buddy up with a, with a priest. But the uh, message that he's sending in The Exorcist 3, and also to a certain extent in The Exorcist, is that mental illness is not the reason people are, are doing evil things. And that is a, certainly a welcome message for Jeffrey Dahmer because he's basically saying to Jeffrey, oh, you're not doing these things because you're crazy. 
you're doing these things because you're a villain, you're an evil guy. <laughs> you know, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it delicious to be so evil? Uh, but, and he makes him into sort of like a hero, heroic figure, right? I mean, you could almost see him as, uh, uh, I mean, anybody who's working with, with demons, well, you know, they're on a, a different plane than most of us. That certainly distinguishes him from all the other serial killers who we assume are doing these horrible things just because they're nuts, right? So he's, he's given Jeffrey Dahmer a, 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 a purpose in life, right? He's made him seem better than what he is. One of the things I always thought about, one of the reasons why I don't particularly care for serial killer stories is because there's no drama there. There's not, it's like getting hit by a tornado. You can have a conversation like that with your serial killer. They don't have the mental ability to. They don't know why they're doing the things they're doing. It's not like they have a calculated purpose that they're trying to fulfill some biblical, biblical prophecy. They're just fucking crazy. And it's usually tied to <laughs> sexual stuff, right? <clears throat> it's, they don't, they, you know, sex involves sadomasochistic feelings that people have, and they can't handle that. They don't realize that when you're with a sex partner, maybe that person wants you to tie them up, but they don't want you to cut them up, right? I mean, the, the psychopaths or sociopaths don't have empathy for, the peop for anybody else. That's the reason why they're so fucking dangerous. So he's sending a very pernicious message to, to everybody, but to serial killers. And I, I hate to say this, there's another thing about this that isn't really addressed. And I guess it's something that Peter Blatty would never want to address, which is the, this horrible ongoing decades long sex scandal in the Catholic church. In the book, he has a scene where somebody that Father Damien Karras uh, is counseling comes to him and says, the terrible thing about being a priest is that I'm so lonely all the time and I can't express friendship for my fellow priests because they think I'm a fag, right? So he works that into his book. It's a, 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 practically a chapter in his book. Obviously, this is an issue for him. I wonder what he thought about all these priests, including, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, the guy who played Father Dyer just this past year, it being revealed that he's been accused of sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, what would Blatty, what, you know, I mean, he's presenting this all-male club as a wonderful world to live in, but apparently some of the guys in the club are messing around with the altar boys, right? What, is he th what would he think about that? How, and how, to what extent is the message that he's sending in The Exorcist uh, responsible for that in a way? Maybe all these guys that came into the priesthood who shouldn't, they ended up looking for other ways to occupy their time. Have I said too much? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, if we're talking of, if we're talking about serial killers having, you know, a lot of sexual repression issues, coupled with, um, you know, a lack of empathy and extreme compulsive behavior. I mean, it, what is religion if not a way of trying to repress certain base human desires? And when you repress those desires, some really bad fucked up shit can happen. And it doesn't just have to be your sexual appetite. Um, anytime you're trying to fight what human beings need, I mean, we, we, we all get... We all get the, the, the sex itch the same way that we all get hungry and we all have to use the bathroom. There, there are certain things that are just part of human nature. And when you try to turn those things off, you become very sick. And that sickness can be physical, it can also be mental, it can be emotional. Um, that's, that's a really interesting question. I, I know that Blatty was a very... He was a very devout Catholic. Um, he was waging a war of words and trying to mount um, legal uh, campaigns against Georgetown University, you know, the school that he attended and also filmed The Exorcist and The Exorcist 3 at um, because of their tolerance of abortion. Um, that was uh, he, he happening. Objected. He objected just because one of Obama's administration were going and speaking at the, at the university. It's not as if Georgetown University said, well, does everybody have an abortion? Right, but the fact is that he thought that that was desecrating um, this very sacred institution and this, um, you know, the, the fact that it 
was an upstanding place of uh, very, very specific ideals, at least in its inception. And now it was being perverted by, you know, liberal politics and, and you know, these crazy ideas like tolerance. And, and he, went um, so, he went so far to say that he thought that abortion was demonic, which actually set off a little bit of a philosophical or theological debate. I don't know where it would fall uh, for a time there with, uh, priests and uh, various uh, parties questioning whether abortion is the work of the devil or the work of demons. Uh, but I, I have to say, I think that the fact that he reached that sort of extreme, and Friedkin seems to have moved in that direction as well, he seems to have become a much more conservative uh, figure, um, that's kind of sad. Uh, I, I don't think that Friedkin had any strong philosophical beliefs when he was making his movies early. Only somebody who is sort of uh, agnostic about these things could do a movie like uh, The Night They Raided Minsky's, which is like an old-fashioned comedy about uh, strip clubs, and mm -hmm. then do a Harold Pinter adaptation, which was actually very good, I thought, and then do uh, The French Connection and The Exorcist, and then switch to doing something like Cruising, and the boys in the band. I mean, wh how would anybody who had those sort of conservative feelings at that time say, well, yes, I'm going to be the guy, I'm going to be the go-to guy whenever Hollywood gets around to doing the A-theme films, I'm going to be raising my hand. That doesn't seem like a guy who was very conservative at the time. Or maybe it's just he didn't care. He didn't have any strong feelings about anything. He was just a great filmmaker, and he was willing to put his genius to work on whatever script was given to him. I'm always interested to see that he was fascinated by the little criminal things that happened along the edges of his film, like uh, the fact that the guy who is one of the doctors in The Exorcist uh, giving her the test turned out to be, what, a murderer or? A... Yes. Yeah, killed, was his, so, killed his girlfriend or his roommate or something? If that's, that's the sort of thing, it's a detail that if, as a filmmaker, if that had happened, I would not be talking about it because you don't want to distract um what the real, uh, where the attention should be going. The audience shouldn't be sitting there thinking, well, that guy turned out to be a murderer. Uh, so I'm surprised that he would talk about that. But then when, when cruising comes along, I read interviews where he was very interested in trying to describe all the actual events that cruising was based on. And of course, he's become a master of that. He spent the past 30 years talking about all the actual events that The Exorcist was supposedly based on. Uh, and I remember at the time the film came out, he didn't seem, he, he, he didn't really uh, deal with that sort of stuff. He just said, you know, we, it doesn't have any message and it's supposedly based on true events. But he stayed away from this nonsense now that he seems to be fall, uh, falling into now of saying, yes, it was a real uh, possession and yes, it was a real exorcism and our movie w was directly taken from it. Uh, that's a, uh, an unfortunate direction. It is. And the, the true story, and I say that, you know, with finger quotes, the true story behind uh, the, the exorcist is any, a, a close look at the available material out there will find that that story, the, the alleged exorcism from 1949, um, and it, it, not alleged in the sense that an exorcism did take place, but the possession and all of the events surrounding that boy are very problematic and point toward um, a lot of psychosexual issues and uh, possibly some abuse that he was you know, being we abused by confirm. his aunt. That, that is one of the stories. Um, I don't want to say anything necessarily that's going to get me in trouble right now, but there are numerous family members who had some very, very odd behavior in that case. Um, but nonetheless, Friedkin, I mean, Friedkin is a spin doctor. That, that is a man who, along with Warner Brothers, was able to create such a mystique around the production of The Exorcist that you've had so many other films try to cash in on the concept of a cursed movie where all of the, you know, the devil was trying to prevent us from making this film because, you know, all the sets burned down except for the bedroom set and all these people died during the shooting of it. You know, things that happen in real life. Mm -hmm. Having a serial killer though, who a real serial killer in your film um, that is all about evil. Well, I mean, that, that's a wonderful talking point. And, you know, Friedkin is, has always been somewhat unreliable 
his stories change. Absolutely. And if you look at the literature it, back in 1974, after the film was in release, he was claiming that the way that they accomplished Linda Blair's levitation scenes which are so depressing now in definition because now you can see the piano wires that you couldn't see before but nonetheless he was saying that those sequences were accomplished through the use of electromagnetic fields <laughs> total bullshit total mm -hmm. bullshit even blatty was coming out in the press and going i have no idea what the hell this guy is talking about <laughs> because no, no giant magnets were being used and no, you know, there were no lee lines involved with this or whatever. But, you know, it, it, well, it most, freaking is a wonderful storyteller most movies, in more ways than one. Most commercial films, you'd say there's no harm in that sort of P.T. Barnum approach. But in a film where the whole point of it, the reason why it was so successful is because it was so completely believable, right? That to layer on all this horseshit it really distracts and makes you seem like uh, less of an artist and more of a, of a huckster. Uh, the uh, sad thing for me is to see how many people fall for all that business. Even Ellen Burstyn uh, in interviews says, well, she thinks there was an awfully lot, awful large number of people that died. It wasn't, you know, this is, and there weren't even people involved with the production. I mean, if you include people's brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, then sure, they're going to be at a, Crew and a cast and a crew of hundreds of people. There are going to be some people that die in the course of a year. It's not. Uh, I mean, they do that with a lot of movies. They did that with the pol with Poltergeist as well, right? They have a fire on the set or something, and it's the devil. Why would the devil want to stop you from making this movie? This is the best advertisement that the devil ever got. I mean, if it was a good advertisement for the Catholic Church, it certainly did all right by the devil as well, right? And that's really when you stop and think about it. That gets to the question that's in the film, which is why is the devil doing this to this little girl? And they, in the reinserted scene, uh, say, Father Marin says, well, it's because the devil wants us to despair and he wants us to doubt that God could love us or something to that effect, which is right off the stable floor, right? I mean, that's nonsense. The, why would de the devil go through all this trouble over a little girl and a few people that are standing around and watching? And if the devil really wanted to get it, uh, uh, create evil in the world, to stir up evil, how about whispering to one of those priests, hey, take a look at that little boy over there. That's, you know, a possession that really causes real harm. Just look at the effect that the sex abuse scandal has had on people all over the world for the past right. 30 years. Well, yeah, and I think that you're, you're, you are setting yourself up if this is supposed to be some sort of an evangelical message um, for the criticism that the devil isn't all that frightening when he or his minions have the ability to manifest by taking over a human body um, and controlling it like a, like a puppet and choosing of all the houses in Washington DC or in a suburb um, in that area to say, I'm gonna go after that 12 year old child rather than that other house in Washington DC where there's a guy with his finger on the literal button to nuke all the countries in the world. I mean, it, the devil is thinking very, very small. Here. Somebody, <laughs> so, somebody at 20th Century Fox must have had the same idea because we got the omen a few years ago. Yes, yeah. So, Billy, Billy, let me ask you this. Do you think that this movie holds up still when you watch it now? Do you get the same creepiness and uneasy that you get that you had the first time you saw it? Um, just probably by like the head turning part. Just a head turning part. <laughs> yeah, right now still, but no, it still holds up. It's still like nothing's probably ever going to be when it comes to Exorcist movies. I mean, you're never going to be. You're never going to find that same magic. It's, right. Uh, right. This is number one when it comes to the Exorcist movies. Aaron, what about you? you? Think it holds up? Still got the same chills that you had got before. <laughs> Yeah, like I was trying to say before, yeah, it's one of my favorites. It always will be. Um, yeah, it, it it freaked me out when I was younger, and I still get that uneasy feeling, like like everybody's saying, you know, it makes you feel uneasy, like, holy crap, this could really happen, you know, uh, in, in some people's mind, this could really happen, so, but uh, yeah, I love it, and I think it holds up. One, one thing I would say uh, in favor of uh, Peter Blatty, William Peter Blatty as a director, 
there's one scene in Exorcist 3 that is unsurpassed. And the reason why it works, I think you know the scene I'm talking about, the uh, jump scare scene with the uh, the nurse being attacked with the uh, scissors. Yes. Which are not a real thing, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is a flaw in, my, in the storytelling, in my opinion. You should not use imaginary instruments in, in a film like that. Uh, but uh, the reason why that works is because he forces people to look deeply into the frame. They have to watch stuff that's far away, and they have to interpret the stuff they're seeing, right? And then when something happens that is so abrupt, it's genuinely shocking. And in a way, it's tied to the whole idea that the best way to really disturb people is to force them to use their imagination a little bit, to look deeply, to pay attention, right? That's when you have them in the palm of your hands as a filmmaker and you can really, you really have the opportunity to shock them. But most filmmakers today, when they're doing horror movies, it's a lot of quick cutting, a lot of CGI, and a lot of the horror stuff, the gore and the monsters, right up front. But no mystery. The audience doesn't have to, have to use their imagination. They don't have to look for anything. They don't have to interpret anything. One of the things I wondered about was whether or not that scene when Lieutenant Kinderman picked up when, uh, Reagan's pictures and there's a drawing of a what looks like a lion or a dog with angel wings, was that the thing that inspired the thing in the Amityville horror of the, was it a child's drawing of a pig or something? They saw a pig outside the window and they drew, drew a picture of it. The, yeah. the, the point I'm trying to make is that the when people look at children's drawings, they're so crazy sometimes that we interpret them in odd ways and they can, it can be kind of chilling, right? It's scary. And that's another example of how people's imagination, what they bring to the thing, is more powerful than anything you can create in CGI or, you know, anything you can contrive. Uh, well, that, that's my little piece on that. Right. Okay. <laughs> am, I, am I right about that? Is that is it possible? That drawing that he held up, did that have some meaning? Uh, I think it had meaning in so far as the fact that we all now know that Reagan is actually a spiritual healer uh, being attacked by Pazuzu because of her... Um, Teilhard de Chardin uh, influenced psychic abilities that can only be unlocked by way of an experimental hypnosis machine called the synchronizer um, that can be utilized <laughs> to um, unlock her potential as the good locust that will defeat the, uh, um, yeah, Exorcist the, 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 right. or, or <laughs> The synchronizer was the Exorcist II's version of the head chopping scissors, right? Right, something, that, yeah. something that just made up and brought <laughs> in and that really that movie I, you probably don't want to get into a deep discussion on the exorcist too but that movie really strikes me as a disgrace you know and a, a, what foolishness they go to a director who already turned down the first one because he thought the story was deplorable he didn't want to have anything to do with it and they say well this has been a tremendous success so now we want you to do uh, the sequel and of course, he turns out something that's completely unacceptable to them and to everybody. Okay, I'm going to argue this fact. If you guys ever want to do this conversation again, but talk about Exorcist Two: The Heretic, I am there. Just name the time. We'll have, the we will have to do that. We have to. Do that. I am there. Now, now there, there's one thing I want to touch on, um, Eric. You, I believe you told me that you were the first person outside of Warner Brothers to see Dominion: The Exorcist, right? That is correct in so far as I know, yes. Okay. Now, of course, we know that, that there was, what, two movies, right? They mm -hmm. filmed it. They filmed it, and then they, like you said, they put it on the shelf, and then something made them go back and basically refilm the entire movie. What was some of the story behind that? The, the short version of a very long story is that Morgan Creek, who owned the uh, Exorcist franchise at that point in the early 2000s, decided that based on the success of the re-release of the original film, as the version you've never seen, they wanted to make another film and they wanted to really have this franchise spawn a TV series, which it would ultimately do much later on, um, and that they could pump out more and more sequels. And they started off with a prequel film telling the story of Max von Sydow's character, Father Marin, as a much younger man. They went to Stellan Skarsgård to star in this film and they hired Paul Schrader, 
who's best known for writing Taxi Driver, The Last Temptation of Christ, Raging Bull, but has also directed a couple of really, really good films of his own. Um, not to mention and, cat people. And not to mention cat people. <laughs> but uh, they ended up hiring him, and the film that he directed was not particularly scary. And the studio freaked out, and they, in a very unprecedented pre Disney Star Wars move, decided that they were going to put the film on the shelf. Um, they were going to tweak the script. They rewrote it, but it's basically the exact same movie. Mm -hmm. um, they utilized the same cinematographer, Vittorio Storaro. They utilized most of the same sets, most of the same actors with a few recasts here and there, but they got Rennie Harlan to come in. And it, it was like the ultimate film school experience uh, experiment. It's like give two very different directors pretty much the same script and the same cast and crew and watch the end result side by side. And in the case of Rennie Harlan's movie, it was called Exorcist, The Beginning. It came out in um, August of 2004, and it was a terrible bomb. And this is after Morgan Creek had shot two movies, two completely different movies, and then spent money on the advertising campaign. It, it was a huge investment to do this. And it, this wasn't Star Wars. This wasn't reshooting, you know, Solo after it had already been done. This is The Exorcist. It was a very different sort of blockbuster and required um, more of a return than a Star Wars movie was guaranteed to get. And what ended up happening was they panicked, Morgan Creek, and they said, what the hell are we going to do here to recoup our investment? Then they start looking at Paul Schrader's movie sitting there on the, the shelf, and yet at this point still in an unfinished state. And they decided that they were going to premiere it in 2005 at the Brussels International Film Festival. And prior to that screening, I was writing for a, a movie website at that point, and I managed to wrangle an invitation from Schrader to go to New York, to go to his office, and to see the film. So I watched Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist, which is like a, an alternate universe version of Exorcist the Beginning. And I watched it in Schrader's office. It had time code running along the bottom. It had a title card that just came up and said Exorcist 4. And the thing as a filmmaker that originally stood out in my mind was the fact that I was like, okay, I know what rough cuts look like or what unfinished films look like. There are a lot of people who just assume that what is filmed on set and then uploaded into your computer or edited on your flatbed editor on film, that's what the finished movie looks like. And that's not the case because an unfinished film does not have the Foley sound effects, does not have the, the full mix applied or ADR or score or color timing, all sorts of components that are so vital to the way that a movie feels when you watch it. And so watching what I saw, I was like, okay, this is an unfinished movie. I can tell I can fill in the blanks with my brain. And after I watched it, Schrader took me out to lunch and he gave me the first tell-all interview. I did a review of the film. I published the, the interview with him. He spilled the beans about everything because at that point he was like, my movie is going to get screened at Brussels. I have absolutely nothing to lose by spilling all the dirt here. Um, they're going to have to release this film, even if it's direct to DVD, just to make some of their investment back. And ultimately that's what happened. But what was so depressing was when it came out and I'm telling everybody, I'm like, guys, this is such a better version of Exorcist the Beginning. Everybody's got to watch this movie. And I go home and I put the DVD in my player and what comes on is almost completely what I saw in Schrader's office. Because Morgan Creek gave him basically like $2 to finish the film. And so it doesn't look or sound or feel like a finished movie. It has, has special effects that aren't all there. Schrader's wife, Mary Beth Hurt, is, you know, she did a, a voice temp track for the demon. That's what's in the finished movie at this point. It's really hard to be able to watch Dominion and to give it a fair estimation of its value, especially when you compare it to Exorcist the Beginning which is not a good movie either, but it is a polished version of the same thing. Did you, have you seen the film, the Schrader version recently? Yes. 
Did yes. Did you notice any improvements? No, no, it's exactly the same movie as 2005. Yeah, that's funny because <laughs> I, I seem to, I mean, it's just me, I guess. The hyenas look much more convincing. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting used to CGI hyenas. But um, did he, in his discussions with you, did he give you any idea of why it is that this little crippled boy, Chi Chi, who is in Kenya, is played by a Filipino? <laughs> the, what was in the original script and what was not in the finished, or if we're gonna call it the finished film, was that this boy was partly an outcast and considered um, to be a bad omen in the village um, based on his physical appearance, which was the result of his mother having been raped by a foreign soldier. Oh, I see. And so he was supposed to be, you know, mixed a mix, yeah. mixed I thought blood. It, it and that... seemed a little, it seemed a little unfortunate because it seems like uh, it sort of plays on these old ideas that the charted children look mongoloid, you know, is the expression that they used to use, which means that they look Asian. And in this, he's all through the movie wearing all the sort of things that you would say are sort of stereotypical mongoloid things. I just didn't understand why it was in there. I mean, in the uh, Rennie Holland version, it's a, a black boy that plays the the child. And he isn't even, uh, the one thing that I would say, in my opinion, is definitely a positive about the Holland version is that he doesn't end up being the one who's possessed because um, there's a, 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 the Exorcist series has a, a, a sort of race problem. There are no black people in the first movie other than nurses. And they found out that the Exorcist played really well with black audiences. I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, I got this off of Wikipedia, so you take it for what it's <laughs> worth. But apparently they didn't book it into black theaters in Los Angeles, into theaters in black neighborhoods, because they didn't think a black audience would have any interest in the subject matter which is sort of understandable. Turns out they were wrong. All the folks coming from the black neighbors came to the, to the theaters and the white neighbors to see The Exorcist. It was a big hit with the black audience. Now, what I'm wondering is when the time came to do Exorcist II, did they say, well, we got to make sure that some of this takes place in Africa and that we have some black faces in it because we have a fairly large audience of people that are black that want to see this movie. That seems to be something that they do in each film. And at the same time, they somehow managed to avoid making any of the black characters important in any way, right? And yeah, even in that one instance where you say, here's a black character that will actually be the focus of the film, and they, they pick a Filipino guy to play the part. Absolutely, and I, I think that the success um, of the original film with African-American audiences is the reason why the first rip-off film that was rushed out the gate was Abby, right. the, the William Girdler black exploitation. And yeah, you start seeing more representation as the films go on, but, you know, it, it, it tends to fall into, you know, the sort of, um, you know, the primitive savage um, yes. archetype versus characters with agency or, or real, um, you know, a, a real place in the story, in the narrative, other than to sort of prop up the heroic white you know, characters. What I, what I felt sorry, the guy I felt sorry for was the guy who had to play that same part as sort of like the, the, the guy, their assistant, uh, the guy who's the interpreter. He's playing the same part in two movies. He had to go through that twice. And all he does <laughs> but to stand there with a pained expression on his face and tell the, the tribe leaders what this guy is telling. I mean, that's a Talk about, talk about a thankless role, right? And he ends up getting a spear in him at the arm. <laughs> oh my God. The one thing you don't want, right? But we got, we can at least say Andrew French, I believe his name is Andrew French. He got paid twice. So, yeah, well, that's true. you know, <laughs> maybe he's not complaining. <laughs> so, Billy, what's your, uh, what's your final thoughts on, let's just say, all the Exorcist films, except for two, because we'll save it for another episode. <laughs> so, out, like, rank them, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, just you know, right. just thoughts on them. You don't, have to, you don't have to rank them. Well, I've only seen The Exorcist and Exorcist Three. I've never seen any of the. Uh, you never seen Part Two? <laughs> yeah. No, oh, wow. I have not. I have not. God is with me. I've him. not seen um, <laughs> the other ones too, like the beginning and all that. Oh wow. What What do y'all think about the show, The Exorcist? I never watched it. I didn't watch. Never it watched it. 
No. I haven't either. Any of y'all? Have y'all anybody else? No. No. Nope. Sure. I I have, and if you've ever wanted to see uh, a priest in an exorcist film or television series battle a demon by dragging a possessed person into the water from a beach, wrap a stole around his hand, and then use it to punch the water, therefore turning it into holy water, which expels the demon from the body. This wow. is the show for you. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's like weird, yeah. <laughs> magic. I have to check that one out. I, th I think it's on Hulu. Uh, Aaron, what are your uh, thoughts on? <laughs> uh, no, uh, this whole conversation. I mean, I know we uh, sat here. We listened to you guys, man. I mean, I, I really like. I learned seeing a it lot of that. stuff I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot too from these movies, um, or from you guys talking about these movies. Um, like you said, the the dominion in the in the beginning practically the same film little tweaks here and there and uh, both are not very good <laughs> but the beginning i think has more uh, nods to the original film in my opinion um but yeah like i said you can't beat the exorcist and you know they try to capture lightning in the bottle and you can never do that you know twice so um but yeah uh, very informative <laughs> You know, my thoughts on like the the, the original Exorcist, like I said, I saw it when I was a kid, but I don't really remember when I saw it. And the creepier parts that stood out to me were like the, you know, his mom in the street. I mm. think it's just because it had that dream, almost like a, it was almost like a nightmare kind of scene. Um, looking back at it, looking back at it now, as I guess I would consider myself sort of atheist. I don't really believe in religion or anything. That's why I look at it now as more of a metaphor for, um, you know, mental health or, you know, you know, just the way they treated mental health even back then, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'll, part two, I don't really care for part three. I really enjoy part three and then the, the, uh, the prequel and dominion. I root now I could, if, if I never, never see those again, I'd, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, William, go ahead and tell us your thoughts here. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think the first one is uh, a masterpiece. I think that's something for the ages. And I think that probably if there are younger folks who uh, can't really appreciate it, it's because they're going to it expecting it to be entertainment or they're expecting it to be a horror movie, a fun popcorn movie. Uh, it comes from a time when, for a brief time at least, um, Hollywood was making serious films. They've continued to make serious films around the world, but in the United States, after Star Wars, and I love Star Wars, but after <laughs> Star Wars, everything had to be mindless entertainment. Mm -hmm. Not stupid, but it had to be the th sort of thing that would uh, you would be entertained by it without having to really think deeply about anything and would make you feel good. And The Exorcist certainly didn't do that. So The Exorcist is one of those films like Straw Dogs and Clockwork Orange and mm -hmm. the Godfather films. Oh, man. Uh, and The French Connection, which is a very downbeat ending. They're not films that are meant to be entertainment. They're meant to be works of art, really. Uh, they're meant to be intense experiences because even as Stanley Kubrick said, film is about emotion. It's not about intellect. You know, he always was putting off people who were trying to analyze 2001, figure out what it means. And he said that it was the young people that were experiencing it the way it should be experienced, which is just let it wash all over you and make of it what you will. Uh, so I, I love the film. I'm completely in disagreement with his philosophy. I think it's bad thinking. It's, you know, uh, I won't say evil, but it's not, not something I would want to put my name on. But I admire the filmmaking. I can't help but... Uh, and uh, as far as the sequels, well, I just, I don't know what to say. I, I assume and I, and I hope that a lot of people lost their jobs because there's no excuse. For <laughs> it's, it's, I understand they're doing a commercial thing and that's fine. But to be so inept, you know, I mean, we often think of studio executives as being evil creatures, right? They're always trying to force the artist to do something that they shouldn't mm -hmm. do. But at least most of the time, they're not complete assholes, right? They're not inept. They don't throw money away by making two versions of a, the same bad script, right? I mean, didn't anybody after the first one 
when they saw the first one, they said, oh, no, this is not what we have in mind. Let's start from scratch. Let everybody go home and let's get some new writers in here and let's come up with something that makes sense instead of this thing that we're going to have to try to uh, stick stuff on and take this out, put that on, oh, all this nonsense. As soon as you hear something like that about a movie, you know it's going to stick, right? I mean, Exorcist 2, as you said, they had to pull it out of the theaters, practically pulling the reels off the projectors. <laughs> Liam Friedkin <laughs> said that, and I don't know if this is true, but it's a great story. He said that the crowd, after 10 minutes of the movie, was chasing Warner executives down the block. <laughs> Hard to believe, but it's a lovely image. <laughs> That sort of incompetence is disgusting, in my opinion. It's disgraceful. And to keep doing it, one fiasco, a monumental fiasco that embarrasses everybody, and then fuck with the third one, right? <laughs> you can't leave it alone. Say so Nobody says, hey, you know, the last time we really didn't look too good. Maybe we should let this bloody guy just do what he wants, and at the least we can say it's his vision. If it stinks, it's his fault. Instead, they take it on themselves, right? And the, the, I don't know what the hell to say about the fourth one or the fourth and fifth one. That's just inconceivable to me. That, that's incompetence on an epic level, a mythical level. Uh, and neither of the films turned out to be good films, which is even more extraordinary. You think they would have gotten one right just by accident. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, well, one thing that bothers me is that all of these films are being stuck in the box set with the original film. And that shouldn't be. The original film should be able to be out there and to be appreciated by itself without having this trail of slime behind it. Uh, and maybe we should have a chance, come to think of it. <laughs> it shouldn't have this garbage attached to it. That's, that's not right. That's whatever we think of William Friedkin or William Peter Blatty as people or the message they was trying to sell. They made something really remarkable. And it shouldn't be uh, joined to this, uh, this monstrosity. Uh, that is the rest of the series. The only thing I can think of that's worse is what they did to the Jaws movies. But at least there, it didn't seem like, you know, nobody cared. Right, right. <laughs> just silly. But the interesting thing, they always seize, and this is true not just of the sequels, but the imitations. When they do imitations of a successful movie, they always pick the worst aspect of the original thing to imitate. So they're intent on having somebody with the eyes glowing and stuff coming out of their mouths. That has to be, that's not why The Exorcist was a great movie. And Jaws was not great because it had a fucking plastic shark running around. And yet in the sequel, the first thing you see is the shark. <laughs> yeah. It's like they didn't learn any of the true lessons from the film. They just saw superficially that there's certain, you know, like tinsel and Christmas balls that we can put on a thing and people will sort of say, oh, that's Jaws. But it's awful, you know, and it's embarrassing. All those Exorcist films, if they disappeared, and I say this as a person who loves John Borman's, many of John Borman's movies, and a lot of Richard Burton's performances, because I think he was a wonderful actor, but this is the first film that I saw him in from that period where he had an awful lot of terrible movies. This is the first one where I said, Rich, 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 what, what are you doing? I know you're living high, you got to pay for Elizabeth Taylor's rings and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do this. He's, he's got this look on his face that says it all, all through the movie. It's like, I don't really want to be here. You know, when do I get my trek? Give me a drink. His head, hair is jet black, like he rubbed a squid over it, you know. <laughs> and it's just, and he, he wasn't that far away from the end of his life. So I guess maybe he was trying to get plenty of money in the bank account. But the thing that drives me crazy, again, is the folks that were calling the shots. Why would they think of all the people you should pick to star in an Exorcist sequel? They would get Richard Burton. His name was mud even then, right? It was a long time since he did his uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and they pick him. It's almost like putting a stamp on it, say, this movie's going to be shit. It was a cheaper decision to get him. Well, maybe, yeah. He know. was having a career comeback, mm -hmm. and he, he didn't take the movie so that he could buy Liz Taylor rings. He actually took the movie so he could divorce her for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, fair enough. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> Eric, can we give us your final thoughts there on just the series and all the holder? The... 
most of the writing that I have done for various websites um, have been on the subject of genre theory and franchise development, specifically these these series of films and how you know each installment is in many ways a response to the film that preceded it and also to what the trends were in Hollywood and in pop culture at the time. And The Exorcist is one of my absolute favorite franchises to write about and to talk about because this is a series of films that are constantly chasing the tail of the original film because everyone has a different idea of what an exorcist film should be based on what audiences reacted to in the first film. And any time that a filmmaker tries to lean into those uh, exploitative elements or when they try to go against those exploitative elements, there is always push and pull from the money people Uh, There are always demands that are in place and the films always end up getting reshot and reconfigured in some way or another. So this is probably the most interesting franchise I can think of to look at each installment and see why each sequel was on some level a failure or a, a, a complete and total clusterfuck as they were being made. Now, with that being said, aside from just the sort of, you know, academic side of criticism, this franchise also is probably the one that has opened the most um, personal and uh, professional career doors. I've met so many people and, you know, had so many incredible opportunities as a result of this franchise. I, I'm sitting here talking to you guys wearing an Exorcist shirt. <laughs> I've got Stellan Skarsgård's crew jacket on the wall behind me and a whole shelf over here to my right of, you know, various scripts and production drafts of all of the films. I love these movies, even the terrible ones. And again, because there is so much more to talk about in a bad Exorcist sequel than in a good sequel from just about any other franchise that you can think of. Imagine what they could have done if they would have had Kickstarter and just raised the money themselves without a studio behind them. (laughs) But you know, sometimes when a filmmaker is let off the leash and they're just allowed to do anything they want without any sort of oversight, the the end result is not a good one. Didn't Didn't Paul Schrader do a Kickstarter funded movie after this? Was that the the one? Canyons, the, the Canyons. Lindsay Lohan movie, yeah, oh, which yeah. was interesting. Uh, I have to wonder why <laughs> there aren't more people from his generation <laughs> using Kickstarter. You would think that that would be a great yeah. one to make the movies that they want to make. Because it could be they don't really. How long do you think it's going to be before we see a remake of The Exorcist? I mean, now they got a couple the- years, probably. Couple years. Yeah, oh, bite your tongue. <laughs> it's inevitable. It's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, well, this was a this was a really fun uh, educational talk. Oh yeah, um, William, I'm really I'm very glad to talk to you again. Like I said, I've only really got to talk to you the one time. Eric, uh, you were awesome last time you were on, so it was good that you were able to come back. I was glad I could tease you both in with The Exorcist. And we have to make sure that we all watch uh, Butterfly Kisses on Tubi TV, and is it am- on Amazon as well? It is. Yes. It is. And, 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 and I'll be checking out your film as well. So guys, thank you. This, this, this was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, as I said the last time I was on here, anytime you guys want to let me run my mouth, please, you know, <laughs> I love it. Hey, we're sure. fine with it. That just means we, do get, we just get to sit here and not talk. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to do, um, do your shout out to Eric. Where can uh, anybody find you on the internet if they want to track you down and complain that you didn't like yeah we're we're gonna send your hate mail (laughs) um sure sure um i write for ain't it cool news under uh uh, my 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 full name is eric christopher myers i write for ain't it cool news under the moniker ekm just my initials um you can find me on facebook as ekm you can find me on twitter as ekm Uh, my two features that i wrote and directed roulette and butterfly kisses are both on prime um, and just about every other streaming platform. So yeah, hit me up and tell me how full of shit I am, please. All right. <laughs> uh, William, same with you, but I want to ask you a question. How's the, how's the re-edit on your vampire film going? Uh, I've turned that into a uh, hobby. 
uh, for my declining years. Okay. <laughs> I, I was hoping to have it out last uh, Halloween, but uh, it's one of those situations where there's a lot more work and also, I guess, in a way, I'm, uh, I've been possessed by whatever demons were possessing Morgan Creek. Uh, I keep changing things and adding stuff and, you know, but eventually it'll be done, hopefully this year. That Sleepless Nights uh, that you're talking about. Yes, yes. Uh, my, my vampire epic from 20 years ago. And Demon Resurrection is currently on Amazon Prime. It also can be viewed on uh, uh, a number of other platforms, uh, streaming platforms. And I'm on uh, William F. Hopkins on Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, if you do a search for me, uh, you'll probably not, you know, be able to get away from me. Okay. So, <laughs> and Billy, where can they find you on the internet? They can find me, uh, uh, Bass Salt Wizard on Twitter. <laughs> I love it. Aaron, yeah, what about you? They call me Mr. Poe on Twitter and Instagram and then um, the Slasher app as well. So, yeah, that's where people can find me. All right, let's not forget about your TV show. You oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i i am i haven't plugged it on the show in so long um sci-fi sideshow 8 p.m sundays on b movie tv roku app so sure and you can find me on twitter uh 1313 inc on twitter um of course i'm on facebook i don't really do much on there and as of today <laughs> we are we're we're kind of converging everything over to 1313 inc productions yeah. so we don't have all these different websites and too many 500 you know twitter accounts to try to post oh, to so i'm gonna move all that together but i just want to thank you guys again for coming on this was fun and uh, hopefully you can come back for part two the heretic oh yeah two. yes absolutely thanks very much for having me on yeah, no problem I, you could not tear me away from that conversation <laughs> i'm looking i'm looking forward to it thank you guys oh, thanks guys there you go Unburied dead are coming back to life.